A forward commitment is a contract where the parties are required to perform some action at a given time. A contingent claim consists of a payoff, which is only claimable if a particular event happens before the expiry of the contract. We shall go into an introduction of each of these classes of derivatives, which will explain why forwards, futures and swaps are forward commitment contracts, while options and credit derivatives are contingent claim contracts. At the initiation of a forward contract, one party agrees to buy an asset from another party, not today, but on a specified settlement date in the future, at a specified price. This price is known as the forward price. By convention, the party who agrees to buy is called the long, while the party who agrees to sell is called the short. Neither party makes a payment at this point. The forward price is based on the current market price of the asset, also known as the spot price, adjusted by the cost of carry of the asset. We shall learn more about the pricing mechanism in a future lesson, so we'll leave it as that for now. Once the contract is initiated, it becomes locked in as the contract price. Over the life of the contract, if the spot price rises, such that the expected future price is above the contract price, the long will have a positive value, while the short will have an equal negative value. The opposite is true. If the spot price goes down, such that the expected future price is below the contract price, the short will have a positive value, while the long will have an equal negative value. What happens on the settlement date depends on what is specified in the forward contract. In a cash settled forward contract, the difference between the contract price and spot price is calculated. If the spot price is higher than the contract price, the short has to pay the long the difference. Conversely, if the spot price is lower, the long has to pay the short the difference. Cash settled forward contracts are also known as contracts for differences or non-deliverable forwards. Another form of settlement is known as a deliverable forward. In this case, the short is required to deliver the underlying asset to the long and the long pays for it at the settlement price. Note that the price paid for the asset is the contract price, not the spot price. The spot price has no bearing in this arrangement. So if the spot price is lower than the contract price at settlement date, as in this case, the long is disadvantaged because it is paying a higher price than the market price for the asset. As mentioned earlier, forwards are over-the-counter contracts in which the agreement is between the long and the short. As such, both parties are exposed to credit risk as either party has the potential to default from the agreement. As the contracts are negotiated, they are usually non-standard to fit the requirements of both parties. Forward contracts also tend to be unregulated. In contrast, futures are exchange-traded contracts in which the agreement is with the clearinghouse. The clearinghouse does this by splitting each trade, acting as the opposite side of each position. It acts as the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer. This system allows either side of the trade to reverse positions at a future date without having to contact the other side of the initial trade. Traders will be able to reverse or reduce their position with ease. The clearinghouse also acts as the counterparty for each participant. The clearinghouse enforces rules like margins, which we'll discuss later, on the participants. This allows the clearinghouse to guarantee that traders in the exchange will honour their obligations. This guarantee removes counterparty risk from futures contracts. In the history of US futures trading, the clearinghouse has never defaulted on a contract. To facilitate trading, futures are standard contracts where traders either take the long or short position with standard sizes. Futures markets are usually regulated by the government. The fluidity of futures contracts makes them attractive to speculators who want to bet on changes in the price of an asset. Hedgers can also use futures contracts to reduce their risk exposure to the changes in price of an asset. For example, a transport company can buy oil futures to hedge against future increases in oil price. If oil prices do increase in the future, the company can sell the oil futures at a profit which will soften the increase in operating costs due to increase in fuel prices. If the transport company wishes to take delivery of the oil, or enter into custom contracts more suited to its needs, 
the company can turn to forward contracts instead. Besides these differences, there are three terms that apply only to futures. They are open interest, settlement price and margin. The open interest of any particular futures contract is the total number of outstanding contracts that are held by market participants at the end of the day. Open interest increases when traders enter new long and short positions and decreases when traders exit existing positions. Open interest is therefore a measure of the flow of money into the futures market. Some speculators look for trading signals based on the open interest for a particular asset. Settlement price is analogous to the closing price for a stock, but it's not simply the price of the final trade of the day. It's an average of the prices of the trades during the last period of trading, called the closing period. So as in this case, even though the final trade of the day was done at $88, the settlement price is recorded at the average price of the closing period, which is $76. This specification of the settlement price reduces the opportunity of traders to manipulate the settlement price. The settlement price is used to calculate the daily gain or loss at the end of each trading day. On its final day of trading, the settlement price is equal to the spot price of the underlying asset. Margin applies to futures contracts, but not forward contracts. Recall that under a futures contract, the clearinghouse is able to guarantee that all parties will honour their obligations. This is achieved through requiring both the long and the short to place an initial deposit known as the initial margin. The initial margin per contract is relatively low as compared to the size of the contract. For example, if a trader longs the futures at $100 at this point, an initial margin of $20 may be imposed by the clearinghouse. This initial margin is deposited in the trader's margin account. After the futures contract is obtained, changes in the price of the futures contract result in daily gains or losses. They are credited to or subtracted from the margin account of the contract holder. This is called the marking to market process. The maintenance margin is the minimum amount of margin that must be maintained in the margin account. If the balance in the account falls below the maintenance margin, additional funds must be deposited to bring the margin balance back up to the initial margin amount. So in this case, the trader has to top up his margin account by $24 to bring the account balance back to $20. Note that this is different from the case of an equity account which requires investors only to bring the margin back up to the maintenance margin amount. You're watching an excerpt from our comprehensive animation library. For more videos like these, head on down to prepnuggets.com. At Prep Nuggets, let us do the hard work for you.